Look at this Christmas pudding, don't this look delicious? There's lots of history and folklore around Christmas puddings and there's lots of different names for them and today we're going to show you how to make one. Now this recipe is really simple because literally all we're doing is we're just going to put this into the bowl and then we're just going to mix it all up so it is a bit of an all-in-one method so don't worry if you're a novice you don't need to be an expert to be able to get a really great pudding at the end of this. I've got Ben with me who's going to talk about the history and folklore of pudding. Ben, I've put some things on your chopping board. If you wouldn't mind helping me, just chop some of these of things up. So tell me, uh, tell me some of the history and folklore around Christmas puddings. So Christmas puddings became hugely popular in the Victorian period when Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol. And there was a famous scene of Mrs. Cratchit walking in with a huge Christmas pudding. Yeah. <laughs> and so everyone wanted one of their own. And it became the dish of Christmas. And you have to make your Christmas pudding a little before Christmas Day. Traditionally, yeah. And that's why Stirrup Sunday became traditional. And it was a day when in the Anglican church, the prayer began, Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord. And the congregation would suddenly remember, oh, I must make my Christmas pudding. And so we'd rush home. <laughs> so traditionally, Christmas pudding would have had 13 ingredients. And it was thought to be in honour of Jesus and his 12 disciples. <laughs> really? But we're making something different, aren't we? <laughs> so, yeah. So the recipe that we're making today, is, it's vegetarian and it's also alcohol-free. Uh, now, you can, you can amend that to what you want. I mean, if you want to make it gluten-free, vegan, you can amend it to your own dietary requirements. But this one's vegetarian and alcohol-free today. That's very different to the original recipes, which would have included meat. And it's not meat. so unusual to have something like suet in a Christmas pudding mix. <laughs> but they used to inc include things like shin of beef, leg of beef... <laughs> and occasionally they would be boiled in a calf's stomach. <laughs> the actual pudding? Yeah. And the round Christmas pudding, which we think of, was the way that the masses would have cooked it. Wealthier people would have used elaborate moulds so that they could really show off. So nothing was fancy enough for the Victorians. <laughs> I mean, we are calling this one a Christmas pudding. I'm aware that they weren't always called Christmas puddings, though, were they? No, they started off as plum puddings <laughs> because of the dried fruit in them. <laughs> and that was quite luxurious to the Victorians, to be able to have fruit at any time of the year. And all of the spices, the fruits. Spices also was, uh, it was a, a tell of how wealthy you were. Of course. So really, it was quite a status symbol if you could afford to make a Christmas pudding, let alone eat Christmas pudding. Yes, by 1850, the newspapers were saying that anyone at all expected a Christmas pudding on their table. So what started as just a wealthy dish with rare ingredients slowly filtered down <laughs> to everyone. And now we can't imagine Christmas without Christmas pudding. So my mum always used to put silver sixpences in. The silver sixpence is the most famous little token that might have been added into a Christmas pudding, but there were a range so that all of the family could have their fortune told depending on what you got in your slice of Christmas pudding. Really? Like what? So a thimble would symbolise thrift and that you might be wealthy in the coming year. Wishbone, a little silver wishbone, <laughs> would be that you were going to be lucky. Oh, OK, because we, as, as children, we used to fight over the wishbone out of the turkey. It never used to go into the pudding. Uh, but we did used to fight over it because, yeah, because we always said it was it's good luck, whoever yeah. wins the biggest bit. Yeah, it's been symbolic of luck since at least the 16th century. <laughs> Breadcrumbs. Um, so these are fresh breadcrumbs. Now, um, if you don't have a food processor, uh, don't panic too much. What I've actually done with these is I've frozen the bread that I needed, the 90 grams of bread that I needed, uh, and then I've just coarsely grated it. Oh, that's much easier. Yeah, you don't, uh, don't worry if you don't have a food processor, you don't really need one. So I'm going to add a bit of milk in, then I'm going to ask you, I'm going to invite you to stir said pudding. Yes, so on Stir Up Sunday, everyone in the household was expected to come into the kitchen and have a turn at stirring the pudding. And as they did so, they should make a wish for the coming year. Oh, do I need to make a wish then? I think you should. I think we've got great consistency, so I'm going to invite you up to the table to stir my pudding. And I will try to make a good wish. 
Do I have to keep my wish secret or am I allowed to tell you what my wish is? I'm going to keep mine secret. Okay, I'll keep my secret then. Until at least the end. <laughs> <laughs> Do a grand reveal of what our secret is. Maybe my, I think, I think I should tell you what my secret is. It's that my pudding comes out really nice. <laughs> that sounds like a very good wish. But now we need to get this into the bowl. So if you pass me the nicely greased bowl, thank you very much. We need to try and get this as level as we can so that we've got a nice flat bottom rather than a soggy <laughs> bottom when we pour it out. So we need to get our pudding ready to go into the steamer. We're going to get a piece of greaseproof paper. You also need to put a pleat in the centre and the pleat in the centre is just to help when the pudding starts to cook, it will rise some. Then you need to put some either foil or a tea towel over the top. Again, that's just to help stop any moisture getting in while it cooks. And then we're going to put some string around the top to make sure that everything stays in place because this is going to steam for five hours. We've got a bowl, it's all ready. We need to cook it now. Now it, it says to steam it and we need to steam it for five hours, but don't worry if you don't have a steamer. All you need is a pan that's big enough to fit your bowl in. Um, I've already got my water in here. Now when you're putting the water in, it's really important to remember. How much? The, yeah, exactly. You don't want the water any more than about halfway up the bowl. Reason being, obviously you don't want water to get into your pudding and make a horrible soggy mess. Um, so, we're going to get this in, thank you, beautifully tied knot, just gently lower it so that you don't get splashed with water, pop that in there, get a nice close fitting lid on there, and then we're going to take it over to steam. That looks gorgeous. Don't that look wonderful? It just needs one finishing touch. Oh. The traditional sprig of holly. Okay, and what myth and history or? Well, the holly is one of the few bushes to have bright red berries in the middle of a often bleak midwinter. Yes. So to have a pop of colour was thought to be lucky. So I think all we'd left to do now then is that we need to have a taste. So would you mind if I take this off? Not at all. Oh wow, look at that. <laughs> My wish for Stir Up Sunday was a slice yes. of pudding. So. <laughs> you said you was going to keep it a secret. I'm glad I granted your wish. I hope it tastes as nice as it looks. That is the best Christmas pudding I've ever had. Oh yes, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So while we enjoy this delicious Christmas pudding, we wish you all a very Merry Christmas, however you choose to celebrate it, and we wish you a very prosperous New Year.